Dr. Bowles is the chairman of uh, and department head of the department in which our distinguished guest resides uh, this year, and he has been doing a wonderful job uh, in helping us build a truly world-class department of economics and finance. And before I introduce our distinguished guest, I'd just like to sort of take a moment and reflect a little bit about the Economics and Finance Department, and I see several others of our distinguished professors uh, here with us uh, today as well. You know, when I was uh, a student here at Utah State University back in the dark ages, and I will date that for you, uh, I came here as a transfer student from Stanford in the fall of 1971 as a, as a sophomore student. And I sat right here in these seats uh, and took my first course in Principles of Economics, what you now call Econ 1500, from a full professor by the name of Reed Durchie. And Reed was an absolute master of economics. And it was a wonderful, wonderful course. And it really turned me on to the idea of studying uh, economics. And I went on to uh, get a joint major in political science and economics here, and then stayed for a master's degree in economics uh, here, and then went to Harvard and got a PhD in political economy and, uh, and, and, uh, and government, studying man many of the same fields that uh, our distinguished guest, Bill Shugart, uh, studies uh, as well. And we had, in those days, a great department of economics. In fact, it was the best Department of Economics in the state of Utah. Uh, but we lost some of that over the years. Uh, and we are getting it back. We are getting it back. And I'm very, very pleased to say that within the last five years, uh, we now have an outstanding Economics and Finance Department. And I also want to give a little shout out to our brethren over there in the College of Agriculture in their Applied Economics. Uh, department. They have an outstanding program. And the number of economists are growing here on campus, and the quality of our economists are growing here on campus. Uh, and so I'm very pleased today to say that uh, we are carrying our own in the state of Utah in terms of, of uh, the study of economics. And I think the day is not too far distant when, once again, we will be the preeminent university in the state of Utah for the study of economics. So I congratulate all the professors of economics and finance who are here with us today, and also those who are from the Applied Economics Department. And I see Paul Jackis, who's the department head of Applied Economics. And Paul, in, in, in fairness and in equal time, would you please stand and be recognized? Well, again, my thanks to all of you for coming today. It's not often that we have a Dean's Convocation that features a professor here at the John M. Huntsman School of Business. But then again, it's not often that a professor comes along like William R. Shugart. Bill uh, uh, is a delightful colleague uh, whom we've had a chance to get to know. He's new to Utah State this year. And when he has something to say, people around the nation pay attention. They may not always agree with his insights and his research, but it is valued enough that his uh, column, which he writes for a general audience, is often picked up uh, in places like the Wall Street Journal and the Los Angeles Times. Dr. Shugart, who is well known for his research related to antitrust legislation, agreed to come here last year and become our first J. Fish Smith Professor of Public Choice. This has brought tremendous recognition to the Huntsman School, and we uh, can now lay claim, thanks to Bill, to being the home of a very distinguished journal called Public Choice. It's a journal that Bill is the editor-in-chief of. It was founded in 1966. It's among the top 35 uh, economic journals uh, in the world, and it ranks, interestingly enough, even higher on the list of top political science journals. It is unprecedented in the history of economics education at Utah State University for this university to be the home of such a distinguished journal. Dr. Shugart earned his doctorate in economics from Texas A&M University in 1978. Uh, he is listed among the top 5% of authors, uh, economists, 
active today. He's published more than 200 scholarly articles, book chapters, and reviews. Uh, among those, uh, notably, is his book, Antitrust Policy and Interest Group Politics, a book that showed how interest group pu public policy is sometimes influenced by special interest groups that are often the competitors of those companies being challenged. In other words, regulation is being sought as a competitive weapon in the marketplace. He wrote the wildly quoted, uh, widely quoted scholarly article, Adam Smith and the Custom House. Did you know that after Adam Smith had written The Wealth of Nations, he was appointed by King George III in, 19, in 1798 to be on a commission tasked with stopping smugglers? Uh, have any of you ever had an argument about the designated hitter rule in baseball? Anybody? Anybody ever argued that point? There's got to be some baseball uh, fans who've argued that point. Well, don't argue it with Bill Shugart. He knows more about it than you do. He's studied that issue. And among other things, he uh, found that, uh, and this is, maybe he'll have other things to say about this, but, uh, you know, uh, Ameri in the American League, that's where the pitchers have uh, uh, a designated hitter stand in from them. Uh, and Bill found that, in fact, uh, those pitchers were more likely to hit batters in the American League than National League pitchers were likely to hit batters in the National League. Can you figure out why? Yeah, because there was no reciprocation. You know, when they got into the batter's box, they didn't have to worry about getting beamed by the opposing team. Now, not all of you have had a chance to take a class from Dr. Shugart, although I hope you will. Uh, but today, every one of you will have a chance to get a little sample of what Dr. Bill Shugart brings to us uh, at, uh, at this wonderful school. His topic today is Deja Vu, Economic Perspectives on the Great Depression and the Great Recession. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Bill. Thank you so much, Bill. Appreciate your coming. Thank you, Bill. Thank you much, very much, Dean Anderson. I appreciate that very kind introduction. Uh, the topic I have today is part of a stream of research I've been uh, working on for the last 10 or 15 years, looking at uh, the uh, causes and consequences of, of the Great Depression and uh, what connects up here is that the economic uh, conditions that all of us currently live in have been likened uh, by many people to the Great Depression and in fact uh, Paul Krugman and others uh, call uh, the uh, decline in economic activity that began or became at least became evident in December of 2007 uh, and uh, although it officially ended according to the National Bureau of Economic Research on June, in June 20 uh, of 2009 uh, we're still in a very, very weak uh, recovery uh, that has uh, some similarities, but not a, gr a great deal uh, to the events of, that began in, uh, in most people's mind with the stock market crash in October 19, uh, of 1929 and continued uh, for the next decade uh, uh, until America's entry into the Second World War after the Pearl Harbor of December 7, 1941. Uh, that conclusion that World War II ended the Great Depression is dead wrong. The, the Great Depression, as we'll, we'll see later on, uh, continued uh, and through the end of the Second World War and uh, only after uh, the war was over and troops were demobilized and some of the uh, economic controls were taken off private industry, did in 1946 uh, recovery actually begin uh, in the United States. Uh, so ju just give you some uh, comparative information here. Uh, I'll start out with uh, 
reflect that nothing happened. Never have this problem with chalk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, Jim is is working there. Uh, you know, <clears throat> in, the, in the period immediately after uh, the housing bubble burst uh, in the United States at the end of 2007, uh, during the next uh, two and a half years or so, uh, gross domestic product in the United States <coughs> fell uh, by at most 3.8%. Uh, and uh, even though the recovery supposedly began in June 2009, uh, recovery from that event has been very weak uh, with uh, <laughs> growth rates in real GNP, GDP of uh, somewhere in the order of, of 1 to 2 percent. We're still have, the unemployment peaked at a little over 10 percent during that period in the United States and is hovering uh, in the 8 or 9 percent range right now. But uh, <clears throat> Beginning with the uh, stock market crash in October of, of 2009, up to uh, 1929, here's the headline in Variety, a uh, trade magazine for the entertainment industry that came on the following morning, October 30th, Wednesday, Wall Street lay, lays an egg. And the, uh, it real, the egg was pretty darn big. Uh, by the time, uh, during the course of the next uh, few years, uh, uh, <coughs> GDP fell dramatically. Unemployment soared to 25% of the workforce. And that 25% figure is a little bit misleading in the sense that during th that day, most of the people that were lost their jobs were the sole bread breadwinners in their households. And so the, the effects on uh, personal income were much more dramatic than anything we've seen uh, in, in the recent past. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, the policy responses to the Great Depression and to the so-called Great Depression are very similar. And let me... Uh, start out here with the, the idea that, well, we still don't really understand what caused the Great Depression. Uh, in 1986, Charles Poor, Poor Kindleberger, in a famous book, was still puzzled uh, that uh, 50 years after the event in 1986, economists still did not agree on, on the causes of the Great Depression or understand it. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that's, that's still true to some extent. Uh, people like uh, economic historians like Robert Margot have called, uh, <clears throat> said the Great Depression of 1929-1933 is to economics what the Big Bang is to physics. Uh, and <clears throat> a person that you probably know uh, Ben Bernanke, uh, current chairman of the Federal Reserve System, uh, about a decade ago in a book that he wrote, uh, said that uh, the Great Depression is our profession's holy grail. And if we can figure out what happened, what caused it, uh, we'll go a long way to understanding how to prevent those kind of events from happening it itself. Now this quote from FDR is going to play a big role in uh, my story today. Uh, was actually from 1940, and he was, at the time, talking about history repeating, referring to the America's looming entry into the Second World War, but that quote is equally apt uh, to uh, my topic today because history is repeating itself all over again, even though the... Uh, effects of the Great Recession are not nearly as dramatic as those of the Great Depression. The policy responses to them, both of those events, are eerily similar to one another. 
and they're are equally counterproductive in uh, uh, promoting recovery from the economic downturn. Uh, so <clears throat> most of the work I've done has fallen into uh, four categories here. Uh, number one, the question, important question is, what started the Great Depression? And the Great Depression started here, by the way, in the United States. Uh, why was it so deep? Why did uh, pro productivity or production of goods and services in the United States fall off the edge of a cliff? Why did unemployment soar uh, to 25% of the workforce? Third, why, why did the depression spread essentially worldwide? And last, uh, why did recovery come when it did? Uh, as I said, a lot of people argue that recovery came uh, in the months after December 7th, 1941, but I have lots of evidence here that uh, uh, look at the numbers uh, recovery didn't really happen until 1946, when the war was over. Uh, so some uh, illustrations here of archival photos from the uh, period of uh, 1929 to 1933, when the economy was falling and falling uh, precipitously. Uh, the <coughs> Great Depression wrecked the presidency of Ho Herbert Hoover and propelled uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt into the White House in the elect presidential election of November 1932. Uh, these uh, <coughs> shantyvilles that grew up all over the country, uh, uh, play uh, people lost their homes as they did today uh, in recent years. And they built these uh, shanty towns that everybody called Hooverville uh, after uh, blaming uh, Herbert Hoover for, for the Depression. Uh, people walked around with their pockets out like that. Those are Hoover flags, uh, representing no money, empty pockets. Uh, <coughs> Herbert Hoover, of course, was a Republican. He was accused of being uh, uh, insensitive to uh, the plight of America, American workers, American families, who had been devastated by uh, this economic event. And uh, <clears throat> there was uh, sort of the uh, prime example of Hoover's indifference uh, is that uh, during uh, the later period of his presidency, uh, a bunch of uh, <clears throat> veterans of the First World War uh, gathered in Washington uh, to demand uh, an early payment of, uh, of their retirement bonuses and other compensation uh, that they felt that they deserved as veterans of the American Army in the First World War. Uh, a lot of them gathered in Anacostia, Washington, uh, District of Columbia, uh, and set up on mud flats there, uh, tents and, and, and temporary housing while they organized to try to see Hoover, to see public officials, and present their demands uh, to them. Uh, Herbert Hoover ordered uh, Franklin, I'm uh, sorry, Douglas MacArthur, general, to clear those people out. And uh, he led a, a contingent of current American soldiers uh, down to Anacostia and uh, forced them to go home. Uh, also interesting to know that uh, MacArthur's chief uh, Lieutenant at that time was a guy named Dwight D. Eisenhower. 
uh, who was opposed to uh, Hoover's orders, but nevertheless carried them out like a good soldier. Uh, so we have uh, uh, economic calamity uh, shown in pictures, print, stories, songs. You know, if I can find my clicker here, we can move on. Uh, and just some other scenes. Here's uh, New York City, uh, and one of the iconic pictures of the Great Depression were people that are trying to make a living by selling apples, and they see a bunch of different apple sellers uh, lined up on the street trying to interest passers-by in, in, in buying apples. Uh, if anybody knows the uh, Harold Hotelling's uh, spatial model of competition, he, would, he or she and would be surprised by that empty space. <laughs> uh, there, there should be an apple seller there too, but nevertheless, uh, uh, people were panhandling, they were selling pencils, selling apples, uh, trying to get a uh, 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 little pocket money to survive after they lost, lost their job. So 6,000 people in New York City alone uh, participated in uh, trying to make up uh, migrant farm workers uh, or another uh, victims of, uh, of the depression. A lot of people move west to try to find a place to uh, live and to farm. Uh, since they didn't have enough money to buy their own food, they wanted to grow their own. Uh, uh, whoops, went the wrong way. And uh, as we'll see in a, in a minute, uh, the response of the uh, Roosevelt administration, uh, he, he was elected in uh, November of 1932, but at that time, because of tradition, uh, the inauguration of, of, the, of the new president did not take place until the following March. Uh, in the first hundred days after uh, Roosevelt took office, he initiated a, a, bu a bunch of uh, new spending programs, uh, including uh, most famously the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, that essentially had created jobs that were make work. I mean, in the 1930s, we had sawmills, but here we're uh, Sawmills were very efficient, didn't require much, much labor, but here we have creating jobs by having people uh, using cross saws and uh, axes and other hand tools, uh, cutting up uh, <coughs> wood uh, uh, for use and sale uh, in the shadow of some of the uh, nation's uh, government buildings. So, uh, as the quote from uh, Kindleberger suggests, uh, we really don't know, don't have one <coughs> internally consistent explanation of what caused the Great Depression. And I've just listed uh, some of the ones that have been put forward. Some uh, <coughs> are sounder than others. Uh, Gold, the gold standard uh, has been blamed uh, uh, for creating, uh, at least in the United States, uh, uh, or leading to a bunch of, of policies that led to deflation in, uh, in, in, in the dollar. In 1925, uh, okay, <coughs> most nations had abandoned the gold standard during the First World War. Uh, in 1925, Great Britain was the first nation to resume uh, <coughs> the gold standard, that is to allow uh, the pound sterling uh, to be converted into gold and vice versa at uh, a predetermined uh, exchange rate. And in response to that resumption on the part of Britain, uh, the United States Federal Reserve here uh, 
wanted to take actions to, for two reasons, to defend uh, the exchange rate between the British pound and, the, and, the, and gold, and also to prevent, given that the U.S. Was not, had not resumed, to prevent speculative attacks on the dollar. And <clears throat> the United States was gaining gold uh, during this uh, the late 1920s, after Britain's re resumption. And that increase in gold inflows should have led to an in inflationary pressure on the uh, U.S. dollar to reduce the uh, increase the number of dollars in circulation and, and to reduce its value. Uh, the <coughs> Federal Reserve didn't want that to happen, so it undertook action that <coughs> to defend the dollar uh, by deflating. And uh, <coughs> that actions of the United States is said to have uh, spread to the rest of the world. France was also gaining gold. And they uh, similarly, however, in contradiction to the way the gold standard was supposed to work, uh, didn't want it in, to experience inflation. And so they too uh, took steps, their monetary authority took steps to uh, defend the franc, and that those steps that were taken led to a decline uh, in the uh, value of the franc, rather than, or an increase in the value of the franc, rather than a, a reduction. And it, so it is said that uh, the depression started because of the gold standard being resumed it wasn't a pure gold standard after 1925. It was called a gold exchange standard because in addition to settling uh, international debts with payments of gold, you could, uh, countries had the option of using what were called reserve currencies to make those payments. And the currencies were the dollar, the, the pound sterling, and the French franc. But that the uh, an economist by the name of uh, Barry Eichengreen uh, claims that uh, the, the world was hostage or, or bound by what he called uh, golden fetters, and that it was the <coughs> golden fetters uh, in the international trade area that uh, caused the uh, events that happened in the United States to spread to the rest of the world. Uh, best, ex best evidence in favor of, of that explanation is that if you look at the resumption of recovery in countries across the world, uh, most of the dates at which recovery started start when the country abandons, uh, ab abandons once again uh, the gold standard. Uh, uh, these other uh, explanations uh, take too long to go through them all. I want to focus on the uh, numbers three and four there, uh, the so-called Great Contraction, which is a monetary policy explanation of the Great Depression, which is due mainly to the work of uh, Milton Friedman and his uh, longtime co-author, Anna Schwartz, who uh, blame uh, the Federal Reserve System. Uh, you know, 1920s were a, boom, a boom time in the United States. At the end of, at, after the recovery and demobilization from the First World War happened, uh, consumer spending boomed, uh, production boomed, and uh, the <coughs> Federal Reserve System began pumping a lot of liquidity in, into the e economy, both for reasons of the gold standard and for whatever other reason. Uh, but by 1928, uh, 
the Fed was worried that there was too much liquidity in the system. And the evidence for that was the run-up in stock prices. There was a real estate boom uh, in Florida and other, other parts of the country. And uh, <coughs> Greenspanian uh, ex uh, uh, ex exuberance uh, or uh, Keynesian animal spirits were driving or up asset prices, including stock prices, at a pretty good clip. And so the Fed wanted to uh, rein in, uh, or as I say sometimes, castrate the bulls on Wall Street. Uh, <clears throat> and so it began uh, uh, between February and July of 1928. It reversed course and began tightening up. And it did so by raising uh, the discount rate, which is the rate at which uh, financial institutions could borrow money from the Fed in three steps, uh, uh, starting out at 3.5% interest up to 5% interest by July 1928. And uh, that 5% discount rate was the highest the discount rate had been since uh, the previous recession, which was in the early 1920s, 1920, 1921. And uh, according to Fr Friedman and Schwartz, uh, the Fed's policy initiatives of 1928 were uh, bad news for two reasons. Number one, they, they clearly failed to stop the stop stock market boom, at least initially, but they did begin exerting steadily deflationary uh, pressure on the economy. And so the, that's the great contraction, the great contraction in the money supply uh, over the end of the 1920s is in the monetarist view, uh, the principal cause of the depression. Tight money uh, that went too far. First we go too far with loose money in the early 20s, and then we go too far with tight money in the late 20s, and that pushes the uh, economy off the cliff because price, the price level began falling and continued to fall. And uh, one <coughs> side consequence of that in the view of Irving Fisher and even Ben Bernanke uh, uh, <coughs> raised the real burden of debt on uh, borrowers, homeowners, uh, businesses who had borrowed money earlier in the period under, it, when money was loose, but now found that the loans they had committed to repay were having to be repaid in dollars that were, whose real value was, was greater than the, the, the dollars they had borrowed in the first place. And so that began a, a sort of vicious cycle and it put pressure on banks uh, because uh, borrowers and, uh, were finding it increasingly difficult to repay their loans, and that uh, spilled over into uh, uh, the, the rest of the economy. Um, <coughs> so, you know, why did the Fed mess up? Uh, in the view of, of many people, one is this they were still enthralled to a gold standard mentality uh, and they were trying to defend the, the value of the, the dollar against speculative attacks on it uh, and that uh, uh, and to maintain uh, the value of the dollar uh, in terms of gold uh, at the uh, fixed exchange rate at which uh, the U.S. resumed that gold standard. Uh, but what, either way, uh, uh, the contraction happened. Uh, a third, uh, a, another element in the story is that uh, at the time, uh, the central power in the Federal Reserve was not in Washington, it was in, at the New York Federal Reserve Bank. And the president of that bank was a guy named Benjamin Strong, who uh, from all accounts seemed to 
understand what was going on and wanted to uh, reverse a course again to stop the tightening, but he died uh, in October 1928, and so that was a, there was a power vacuum at the New York Fed, and the Board of Governors in Washington to, took advantage of that power vacuum to shift the center of authority in the Federal Reserve System to the Board of Governors. Uh, so I think the, uh, in my own analysis and, and those of many others uh, suggest that you know, if there was a proximate cause of the, of the Great Depression, it was due to the actions of, of the Federal Reserve uh, tightening up the money supply at a, turned out to be uh, a, a bad time. Uh, but on top of that, uh, let's look at the Austrian perspective for just a minute, which suggests that whether the depression was started by the, the Fed or not, one consequence of the Fed's action was to lower interest rates in the economy in the late 20s. Uh, and Lower interest rates means that more investment opportunities become attractive or profitable. And so there was this rush to invest in real estate, rush to invest in new plant and equipment, and those investments are, ir are irreversible, at least in the medium or long run, you built your plant with money you borrowed uh, at cheaply at low interest rates, but then the Fed takes the actions it takes and real interest rates went up, making some of those original investments uh, no longer profitable. And so uh, in the Austrian view, the uh, not so much the great contraction, but the effect on interest rates caused uh, investments to flow into real estate and fixed plant and equipment, uh, causing uh, a misallocation of resources away from producing consumer goods into producing, uh, investing in capital or producers' goods. And then when th things reversed again, there's a train wreck. In fact, Lord Robbins calls, calls the Great Depression the wreckage of false expectation. That investors had been led to believe that interest rates were going to stay down, and so they invested uh, uh, in fixed capital in consequence, but then when interest rates spike again, uh, they are, uh, can no longer... Uh, repay and, 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 and the, those, those fixed investments are no longer uh, profitable and the only way to get out of things is, let, let, is to purge, let businesses fail, let uh, liquidate stocks, liquidate investors, liquidate the farmers, liquidate real estate. Those are the words of uh, Secretary of the Treasury at the time, uh, under Her Herbert Hoover, uh, Andrew Mellon, he, he said that uh, liquidation, uh, allowing uh, you know, the, those false expectations to bite people in uh, the right place would uh, purge the rottenness out of the system. High cost of living and high living will come down, he said. Uh, people will work harder, live a more moral life. I don't know about that. Uh, but uh, values will be, those values have to be adjusted. We're out of adjusting. We have too much investment in capital or plant and equipment and not enough uh, investment in producing uh, uh, what the Austrians call lower order goods. Uh, like, uh, or consumers. Uh, 
but uh, those values need to be adjusted. And enterprising people will pick up the wrecks of the less confident people, the people that falsely were, whose expectations were not realized, lose their businesses. But the capital doesn't go away. Its value falls, and somebody else can buy it and put it to a more profitable use. Uh, but the possibility of those kinds of adjustments were short-circuited by uh, policies adopted by uh, President Hoover and President, even more so by President Ro Roosevelt after him, who, you know, seeing these falling prices, falling income, thought the way out of the, fo of the woods was to prop them up, try to prop up wages and prices. And so, for example, uh, after Ho Ho uh, um, Herbert Hoover had started a, a, a program called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was supposed to use taxpayer money to uh, uh, lend to banks and other uh, businesses to try to get them jump-started again. Uh, the problem with that was that uh, Somebody let the cat out of the bag and identified the banks that were getting these loans. And the fact that they were getting the loans meant that they must be in trouble. And so we started runs on banks. Depositors actually went down to their bank to try to pull the money out. And that snowballed up to the point where, uh, uh, by 1933, uh, more than 3,000 banks had failed uh, in the United States. Most of them, it turns out, were smaller uh, state-chartered banks. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there's a carnage uh, on Main Street uh, caused by bank failures uh, was as serious as the carnage on Wall Street uh, caused by uh, the uh, crash uh, in, in 1929. Uh, so <clears throat> when, when, the, when the Fed reversed uh, to a tight money policy, uh, the possibility that market-based adjustments would proceed were short-circuited. And moreover, uh, the policies of the first New Deal in particular, uh, Hallmark being the Agricultural Adjustment Act and the National Industrial Recovery Act, both of which were passed in the first hundred days that Franklin Roosevelt was in office, uh, were designed in the face of declining income, falling output, rising unemployment, to cut output even further, to try to prop up prices and income. So under the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, farmers were <coughs> encouraged and in fact paid uh, to destroy crops, livestock, and their I don't have them here, but there are pictures you can see of farmer, dairy farmers pouring milk out into the road rather than sell it, of pigs being slaughtered, of uh, <coughs> uh, cotton and other kinds of agricultural fields being plowed up and the crops destroyed to try to limit the output of those agricultural goods in the hope that that would raise their prices. But uh, I mean, the contrast is you have starving people, homeless people, unemployed people, not enough to eat, and the federal government's out there encouraging uh, farmers to destroy uh, food crops uh, and, and livestock. Uh, and the same was true with uh, the National Industrial Recovery Act, which created the 
National Recovery Administration uh, that uh, <coughs> encouraged uh, firms to collude with one another to write what were called codes of fair competition that would uh, prevent cutthroat price cutting, uh, limit output, try to raise prices. And so <coughs> the idea was for both of those programs that you, you can raise the incomes of farmers, raise the incomes of uh, other uh, people, that they'll go out and spend those incomes and we'll uh, <coughs> create a process by which uh, recovery will be driven by consumers, consumer spending. Uh, uh, so, <coughs> my one of the points I would like to make, and is that. I don't really care at this point what caused the Great Depression, but I know what caused it to last so long and why it was so deep. And those were policies coming out of Washington which were counterproductive. Uh, in the first New Deal, uh, as I mentioned, we had those two, or the main uh, ornaments of the first New Deal, those two laws. Both of them, ultimately, uh, those two laws were declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court uh, in, uh, towards the end uh, of Roosevelt's uh, first term in office. Well, not towards the end, about the middle, about 1935, 1934, 35. Uh, <clears throat> Roosevelt, uh, despite the fact that uh, Recovery uh, didn't have, well, let me step back. Recovery did start in the United States in 1933. And it continued uh, pretty robustly up until 1937, 1938. But we never got back to trend. We never got back to, the GDP never got back to uh, the level it had had uh, in 1929, and the unemployment rate never got below double-digit rates through that whole period. So the economy was growing, but we never got back to where we started from. Uh, partly on the basis of evidence of, of some recovery occurring, uh, FDR was elected, uh, re-elected to office. <coughs> in 1936, and at that point, <coughs> public policy, uh, federal policy, turned even farther to the left than it had been in uh, his first term. Uh, FDR started blaming business uh, for the depression and for the fact that it was still uh, hanging on, uh, used terms like uh, <clears throat> princelings to refer to uh, corporate uh, presidents and CEOs, uh, malefactors of great wealth, and uh, by 1936-37, he was calling, uh, calling uh, the depression uh, a capital strike. Cap owners of capital were sitting on their hands and refusing to invest in ways that would uh, speed up the recovery. Uh, we, we get uh, WPA, we get uh, a new law uh, called the Wagner Act that provided uh, labor unions with a much greater authority to organize and to strike themselves uh, than they had had under the NIRA earlier. Uh, we also have uh, enactment of the Social Security Act and many other kinds of uh, government regulation that uh, raised uh, the uh, 
cost of doing business and uh, created a lot of uncertainty about uh, the future, uh, future business conditions. And it was that uncertainty, I would argue, uh, that uh, resulted in the downturn in investment or the failure of investment to speed up and create new, uh, new businesses, expand existing ones, and hire uh, ad additional workers. And then uh, 1937, 1938, the Federal Reserve uh, uh, takes other steps that put, push us back into recession. And we have a 13-month period, 1937-1938, where <clears throat> the recovery uh, that had been ongoing gets cut off, unemployment rises again, and uh, <clears throat> uh, business investment and GDP remain uh, growing uh, anemically at best, and uh, the d depression is still with, with us. Uh, even on the eve of uh, America's entry into uh, the Second World War, we have unemployment rates that would, in today's uh, environment, would uh, no one would believe. We never got below about 14% unemployment, even on the eve of the Second World War. And so the Depression lasted uh, from 1929 to 1941. And one, one reason for that is uh, you can write down all these numbers. This, this is a uh, diagram of the major spending program coming out of Washington uh, from 1933 to 1939. The amount of money that's spent uh, by each, uh, in each year, by each agency, and then uh, bringing us all the way down uh, to the end of 1939. Uh, Massive amounts of programs were created, National Youth Administration, Federal Housing Administration, uh, Soil Con Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act, uh, Agricultur New Agricultural Adjustment Act, so on and so forth. Uh, lots of attempts to uh, get the economy uh, recovering, but uh, as I said, we never got back, even with all that uh, spending, uh, we would uh, still in pretty bad shape by the uh, 10 years after uh, the stock market crash. Uh, all that spending, uh, uh, economists including me, have looked at where the money went uh, across states, across program, and the <clears throat> conclusion of all that research is that, yeah, there is some evidence that money went where it was needed the most, but more of the cross-state and cross-program allocation of spending <clears throat> is explained by uh, Franklin Roosevelt's desperate or, or uh, 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 <coughs> want to be reelected in 1936 19, and then again in 1940, that the money went primarily to <coughs> uh, states that were important to the president's reelection aspirations electorally. Uh, the South took it on the chin throughout the Great Depression, if you look at <clears throat> the amount spent per person or per farmer or per firm in the South, it's much, much, much lower than it was in other parts of the country. And one 
explanation for that is that the South was solidly democratic. There was no, no way that uh, states in the South were going to vote for uh, a Republican candidate for president. After all, uh, Abe, Abe Lincoln had been a Republican. And uh, <coughs> from, from his uh, election in, in 1860, uh, initially, and then re-election in 64, the South turned its back on the Republican Party. So FDR knew that he had those votes in his pocket, almost no matter what he did. So there's little, little need, uh, politically, uh, to uh, su supply federal re uh, program monies for relief or, or, or recovery uh, in, in the South. And so we have uh, a, a political explanation for the continuation of the, of the uh, Great Depression that is based on the idea that federal monies that were appropriated by Congress and, and spent by all those agencies that we, in that previous slide, went primarily to states that were important to FCR's re-election hopes and less important uh, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, <coughs> recovery uh, objectives of the New Deal. Uh, we have, uh, <coughs> and that's not a surprise, it shouldn't be a surprise, because Pretty much everybody at the time realized what was going on. And uh, here's uh, FDR on the campaign trail. Uh, not sure which election this is from, uh, but uh, <coughs> notice that FDR is photographed standing up. As everyone knows, FDR had contracted polio as a young man and was confined to a wheelchair most of the time, but could stand on his own two feet if he had, was wearing leg braces and or supported by uh, uh, crutches or uh, 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 Secret Service people or, or, or his son often accompanied him to events, sort of provided a shoulder to stand on. If any reporter at the time took a picture of FDR either in a wheelchair or being carried or assisted heavily by someone else, the Secret Service confiscated the film. And so at the, <clears throat> during his entire presidency, there was rarely a public image of the president that showed his, his disability. Uh, a couple of years ago, they put a, uh, <clears throat> a memorial to FDR on, on the uh, mall in Washington, D.C. And one of the major controversies in uh, designing and building that mall was whether to, or that uh, monument was whether FDR should be shown uh, in a wheelchair. And, and finally, uh, he was, but the, they drew the line at, at showing him with a, holding a cigarette. That was that was verboten. FDR smoked cigarettes heavily, used a uh, cigarette holder and put him directly in his mouth. And many pictures of FDR sh show him smiling with his cigarette holder jauntily angled uh, up, but that, that was too much uh, for the designers of the uh, FDR memorial to take. Uh, here's uh, one of uh, FDR's chief uh, uh, <coughs> lieutenants uh, in policymaking uh, a position, Harry Hopkins. Uh, he was a head of the WPA and played many other roles uh, in the Roosevelt administration uh, throughout uh, its uh, three terms and three months. Uh, and here's my, <coughs> just a picture of the distribution of uh, New Deal loans, insurance, and spending by state uh, per capita, 
uh, <coughs> and uh, the monies are out here in the, in the West and the Midwest. Those are key states for Roosevelt in 1936 as well as 1940, and uh, that's where the money went. Not nearly as much money to uh, the South or the Upper Midwest or even New England because <clears throat> the South was solidly democratic and most of the New England states were uh, 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 leaning, leaning toward the Democratic column. It was out west where the, uh, <coughs> that were swing states in presidential elections. Uh, and their electoral votes were important to uh, FDR hopes. And so that's where the, uh, the money went. Uh, yeah, here's a couple of examples of uh, <coughs> what people knew what was going on. Here's a cartoon from the Washington Star in 1938. And uh, <coughs> uh, WPA money being distributed in, in, in the South. Uh, uh, and it, speaking to uh, uh, Henry Wallace, who was the Secretary of the Agriculture uh, during a large part of the uh, Roosevelt administration. So m money was being handed out. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the reason the money was being handed out was, was politics. And there's Harry Hopkins as Mary, and his little lamb is uh, politics, drawn as a black sheep uh, rather than a white sheep. Everywhere that Harry went, the ram was sure to go. Uh, Harry uh, was very sensitive to uh, FDR's uh, electoral hopes, and so the money that he had from the WPA and other agencies that he was involved with was distributed uh, not entirely on the basis of politics, but primarily. Uh, if you <laughs> look at the cross-state distribution of funds and put things on, uh, try to explain that by uh, you know, the <coughs> drop in, in employment or increase in unemployment in the state from 1929 up to a given year, or look at the reduction in income uh, in those states, you can explain about 20% of the cross-state variation in spending during the New Deal. But if you include, add to that variables that measure political importance of the state, to uh, FDR, you can explain about 75% of the variation. So need played a role, but the <clears throat> politics played an even bigger role in, in where the money went. And <clears throat> Harry Hopkins was uh, famous for saying, spend and spend, tax and tax, elect and elect. He's the fiscal authority of the federal government, judiciously, spend judiciously, tax judiciously, and you can uh, get elected. He claims he never said that, but uh, <coughs> it's been tagged, it uh, that line's been tagged on him uh, ever since. And then, last cartoon here from 1935, Herbert uh, FDR is the conductor and <clears throat> dancing or playing to his tune, to his direction, are the, some of, are the three big uh, names in the Roosevelt administration. Uh, Walker, Secretary of Treasury, Harry Ickes, and uh, Harry Hopkins, all of whom had uh, lots of relief. Uh, the WPA uh, has been <coughs> claimed to be uh, one of the best things that came out of the New Deal uh, work, Works Progress Administration. But if you take a closer look at it, at the WPA, and what was going on under it, uh, it was uh, rife with corruption, uh, 
money was being spent on make work projects like the uh, uh, woodcutters earlier on, uh, lots of other uh, projects, digging holes, filling them back in. Uh, so the term boon boondoggle was coined, uh, I don't know by whom, uh, to uh, <coughs> characterize most of the thing, many of the things that the WPA projects that the WPA funded. Uh, and uh, so it was known at the time as we piddled around. Uh, uh, the <coughs> iconic uh, symbol of uh, the WPA was a worker leaning on a shovel, not doing anything but getting paid for it. And plus, many of the people that were required, that uh, were employed by the WPA, uh, were required to contribute some of their paycheck to the Democratic Party as a condition of keeping their job. And there are <coughs> scandal after scandal of, uh, uh, in political circles at the state level where uh, uh, WPA workers were pressured into uh, uh, tith not tithing, but paying into the uh, Democratic Party's uh, campaign uh, war chest. Uh, so, uh, even though the WPA did lots of things, it built lots of the Hoover Dam and all the other uh, major projects, uh, uh, primarily uh, the things that were funded were make work, uh, fiddle around uh, people for, give people paychecks. And the idea was, well, if they had to work for those paychecks, that would be, <coughs> you'd feel better about it than uh, just on the dole and getting a check for doing nothing. But lots of things that the uh, WPA actually funded were, may have been worse than doing nothing, uh, creating uh, the <coughs> vision or the uh, idea that people were being employed by the federal government. Uh, <coughs> but even at the time, uh, the unemployment statistics, one of the reasons that they remain so high is that these people weren't counted as having jobs. Because they didn't have real jobs. They were doing stuff that, <coughs> or getting paid for doing stuff that, that <coughs> probably was, wasn't worth doing. Uh, get, uh, <coughs> finish up here uh, with just a few uh, remarks uh, about what ended the Great Depression. Uh, and <coughs> it was not the Second World War as I mentioned before. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, at the time uh, that as the war was winding down and victory in Europe and victory in Japan seemed to be uh, a reality, uh, lots of economists worried about as soon as the war ends, we bring the boys home, the Great Depression is going to resume. Because we do have this massive increase in government spending during the Second World War. But all that spending was on military goods, not consumer goods. <clears throat> and lots of plants had been converted from producing civilian goods to mil military goods. For example, the last uh, <clears throat> automobile produced in the United States after the beginning of the uh, Second World War rolled off the assembly line in 1942. It was a Studebaker. And from that point forward, no automobiles were produced in the United States until 1946, after the war is over. <clears throat> and of course, the ending of the war uh, brought dramatic reductions in public spending. Uh, troops that were had been overseas or sent home, uh, and a, a lot of the controls 
that FDR had placed on the economy uh, were phased out. During Robert Hicks, my friend Robert Higgs, uh, uh, argues strongly that one of the reasons that the Depre De Great Depression lasted as long as it did was that people were, investors were uncertain about future course of policy. Uh, as we'll see, tax rates were very, very high during the Second World War. Uh, and they uh, were uh, constant policy changes, introduction of new programs in agriculture and uh, manufacturing, uh, create a lot of uncertainty, which investors don't like. If they don't know what the direction of the economy is going, they're less willing to invest than if they're uh, th the policy is more certain. So we end during the Second World War that regime uncertainty that existed throughout the 1930s, because we have one goal here uh, in the Second World War to defeat the Axis powers. Uh, and the reason that the period of the Second World War should never be characterized as, as being a period in which the uh, Depression was over was because there were heavy, heavy, heavy uh, uh, interference in uh, mar the private market. Uh, lots of early on, uh, the price controls or wage and price controls were imposed on the economy. And if you know Econ 2010 or even 1500, uh, price controls lead to rationing. And there were lots of civilian goods that were either not being produced at all, like automobile, uh, as well as other goods that were subject to severe uh, rationing restrictions. That there were uh, <coughs> a bureaucracy called the Office of Price Administration ended up with something like 90,000 employees by the end of the war. And even Time Magazine ca characterized them as a sort of kitchen Gestapo because they were enforcing uh, these price controls and these uh, rationing, which is primarily carried out by issuing to consumers a little booklet of ration coupons that they had to present to uh, a retailer uh, to <coughs> for the right to buy one of those goods at the controlled price. Uh, and lots of goods were subject to that. The most the good and, and most greatest shortage was rubber. And so one of the things that the uh, uh, federal government did was in addition to stopping the production of automobiles was for uh, new bicycles were confiscated right off the assembly line and turned over to policemen and mail people, uh, <coughs> mail uh, carriers. Uh, gasoline was rationed, Robert was rationed. Uh, and so uh, <coughs> the police and the uh, mail carriers, it's easier for them to get around on bicycles. And so they needed the bicycles, civilians didn't. Uh, <coughs> during the Second World War, tax, the tax rate on mar top part marginal tax rate on personal income was 90%, 94%, I'm sorry. Uh, and we had a 90% uh, tax on what we call it excess profits for corporations to pay. In 1942-1943, uh, 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 the <clears throat> process of withholding uh, federal taxes from paychecks began. And in fact, there were uh, proposals being batted around, which if they had been adopted, would have started uh, withholding for 1943 taxes in 1942, and the people that would still owe their 1942 taxes. And at the top of the income distribution, uh, the effective tax rate was more than 100%. Uh, uh, and there was a lot of violation of civil liberties during the uh, New Deal. Uh, you may have think that uh, wiretapping of enemies and uh, friends was 
Richard Nixon's idea. No, it was FDR. He started it. And he also had an enemies list and used that list, uh, passed it over to the IRS, and uh, <coughs> pressured uh, the IRS into uh, doing audits on people that FDR didn't like. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> dramatic restriction in the availability of, of uh, consumer goods, rationing of those goods. Uh, the only bright side is that uh, clothing was not rationed, per se, but uh, the fabric used to make clothing was rationed because it was needed to make uniform. Uh, and so if you look at movies from the era, all the suits are tight fitting, the dresses are tight fitting uh, because the manufacturers are trying to conserve material uh, that was uh, in, in short supply and, and needed more uh, uh, for uniforms. Uh, but some bright uh, entrepreneur uh, in response to that invented the bikini as a way of saving cloth. Uh, Mankind has been grateful ever since uh, for that. Uh, so, uh, one reason that the uh, Great Depression didn't continue after the Second War is that all the New Dealers were surprised by how quickly it ended. <clears throat> Six days after the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima in Japan, Japan surrendered after the second bomb was dropped. And there, <clears throat> most people in Washington expected the, the war to last much longer than it did, thought there would be an, a land invasion of the Japanese homeland, which would cause loss, lots of loss of life. But the uh, <clears throat> atomic dropping of the two atomic bomb uh, ended, the, ended the war quickly. And so there wasn't time to plan for a new deal, a new New Deal, or to continue or expand the New Deal after the war ended. And as a matter of fact, FDR won, that's what FDR wanted to do. He, he expected the Depression to resume, or re recession at least, and so he was planning to re expand dramatically federal government spending and got federal government programs for relief and recovery. Uh, he didn't, uh, uh, the war ended too soon, and of course FDR uh, had already uh, passed away uh, early into, uh, into after his uh, elect re-election to the fourth term in 1944. Uh, and so uh, Harry Truman, who was his vice president, uh, wrote, uh, <coughs> was elevated to the White House. And he wanted to essentially follow in FDR's footsteps. He, he wanted what he called a fair deal, which in many respects was uh, designed like the New Deal. Uh, and uh, Congress uh, rebuffed uh, all of uh, Truman's proposals and instead uh, enacted uh, dramatic reductions in government spending and introduce some tax cuts. Uh, those tax cuts were not eye-poppingly dramatic, certainly not nearly as much as uh, dramatic as they were in, the, in response to the recession of 1921-1922. Personal income tax rates were cut from 73% to 24%. And that, re that recession slash depression in the early 20s was initially sharper than the fall was in 1929 to 1933, but it didn't last because in response to the tax cuts, uh, the economy boomed. Uh, price controls get dismantled. Uh, the only one that remained in place was the uh, price control on meat, uh, uh, which lasted a few more years. But all the controls on sugar and uh, coffee and gasoline and rubber and, and all of those uh, 
that long but incomplete list of the goods that were subject to rationing uh, in the early and during the war were just swept away. 20, <clears throat> it's true that in 1941, 42, the unemployment rate went in the United States from uh, the mid-teens in percentage terms to essentially zero in 1941, 42. That's because 12 million men either volunteered for, but most of them were drafted into the armed forces. Uh, and so 12 million people disappeared from the unemployment rolls immediately because they were, instead of uh, being unemployed, they were carrying an M1 rifle uh, in the <coughs> mud of France, hedgerows of France, or the uh, jungles of uh, the Pacific Islands. Everybody thought, everybody thought, well, we, the, <coughs> end the war, uh, send all these young men and that were drafted home, the unemployment rate's going to go through the roof again. But the year after the war ends, the unemployment rate's only 3.9%. And 60 million people had jobs. The civilian economy was growing dramatically, perhaps as fa faster during the couple of years after the Second World War than ever. When uh, FDR was campaigning for his first term of office, he promised that 60 million Americans would, would have jobs by the time he was done. That never happened, uh, but that goal was reached in 1946 as a result of the reconversion to a civilian economy. The re resolution of uncertainty, the <coughs> dismantling of price controls, uh, the ending of the Second World War ushered in a period of economic growth that continued uh, for at least the next decade. Uh, and it was one of the most robust uh, uh, expansions of the economy uh, of all time. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> most theories, even though I didn't talk about all of them, see the Great Depression as, as a mistake, a mistake on the part of the Federal Reserve, uh, mistakes on the part of uh, policy making. Uh, but those mistakes uh, uh, ended up, especially uh, after FDR was elected, in deepening and prolonging uh, that, that economic event. And that event did not end until 1946. You cannot com look at full employment, essentially full employment during the Second World War and, and say that the economy was back to normal then. It wasn't back to normal. It was, it, <clears throat> unemployment rate was zero because we had 12 million men in uniform. And on the home front, things were pretty dismal. Most of the production was not for civilian goods, but for war goods. And uh, so you can't compare the economy in, during the Second World War with it, the economy during any peacetime time because the mix of spending and the mix of production is dramatically different in a war economy than it is during a, a, a peace, peacetime economy. And given that <coughs> my conclusion that the Great Depression was deepened and prolonged by the New Deal, it may have been better to do nothing for government policy to <coughs> uh, be uh, stable and to avoid 
uh, what FDR called what he was about, what he wanted to do was bold, persistent experimentation to try anything and everything that might get the uh, economy going again. Uh, FDR said uh, at one point during the New Deal that the early in the New Deal, the country needs, and I, unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold experiment, bold persistent experimentation. Faced with a crisis, it's common sense to take a method and try try that method. But if it fails, admit, say sorry, and try something else. But above all, do something. And that's exactly what I see going on uh, in the current uh, political environment. We've got to do something. Well, no, you don't have to do anything. What, what you may, if you do anything, the thing you should do is cut taxes. Uh, at, at the uh, end of the Second World War, a, a senator from Minnesota uh, proposed uh, a 20% tax cut across the board in, er, in personal income taxes and corporate taxes. Sound familiar? Uh, that po policy proposal didn't make it uh, all the way through Congress in, in its form, but there were tax, tax cuts. Importantly, the corporate income tax rate was cut from 4% to 2% in 1945, in 1946. And the personal exemption for the income tax was raised, taking a lot of uh, low-income Americans off the tax rolls completely. Uh, and that <coughs> exemptions from paying taxes and reductions in rates uh, for other people were uh, is part of the story about why uh, the Great Depression finally en ended uh, after uh, in, in 1946. It's not because it didn't end and the fact it was made worse by the NRA, the WPA, the CCC, uh, and ev all the alphabet agencies that were created during the New Deal spent a lot of money, but didn't get us back even to where we were in 1929. Uh, so I suggest there's a lesson here uh, for current policy. Uh, just two days ago, Ben Bernanke said we're about to fall off a cliff here, a fiscal cliff. Uh, we're facing next year higher tax rates. Uh, and, and he also said uh, cuts in spending, but uh, <clears throat> I mean that's exactly the wrong recipe for recovery. You want to cut spending and cut taxes, and if you do that, uh, we may be able to uh, do the same thing now uh, as was done in 1946. All right, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> will, you, will you take some questions? Sure. Take some questions? Here's a, uh, I wanted to show this last uh, painting. Uh, looks like it was done by you know, a Soviet realist artist uh, from the Stalin era. But here's FDR talking to some farmers. And notice uh, he's on his hind legs there. Uh, artists could not show braces or crutches. Uh, and this is the this is the picture that most people have of FDR. As somebody who's concerned and uh, wanting to do what he can to, for the for the little man, for the forgotten man. But he did exactly the opposite. Uh, Bill has offered to stay a little while and take some questions, but we are at the end of our officially announced time, so. Let's take just a moment, let those of you who need to go, go ahead and go, and then, uh, and then we'll stay for maybe another 15, 20 minutes, Bill, is that okay? Yeah. And ask some questions. But let me conclude by thanking you, Bill, with this little gift, oh. uh, and appreciate well, very much your time.